Good morning, fellow programmers. Thanks for joining me. I'm T. Payne, and welcome to Let's Learn Python. Feel free to use the skip ahead feature on the right hand side to jump to any specific sections. Today we'll be using Python 2.7.6 and Python 3.3.3, both of which can be downloaded from python.org slash downloads. Today's focus is going to be on wormholes and why a jump kick is the best way to travel through them. <laughs> Alright, that's a terrible joke. No, actually, today we're going to be going through the solutions for the final challenges and examples for episodes 1 through 8. You guys have demanded it, and I have given in. <laughs> so, here we go. Alright, so here is the first set of examples from lesson number 1. Um, on the left-hand side, we have uh, x is equal to 5, then x is equal to x times x. And this is just a really elaborate way of saying x to the power of x. And the answer that we'd get would be uh, 3125. So if you punched in 4 or 3 or 2, that would be 2 to the power of 2, 3 to the power of 3, as, and so on. Next on the middle one, we have g is equal to 5, h is equal to 7, and it's just simply re-entering that value in to h to make the total value be 12, because we're just adding them together. Next we have a percent sign. This is called the modulo operator. Used to find a remainder between two numbers. Okay, on the right hand side we have z is equal to 5, and then z is plus equal to 2. So this is going to add two fives to give us a value of 7. So this is actually a very efficient way to add, multiply, divide in values to a given variable. Next we have a is equal to 45, and then we have the times equal sign, t uh, and then 3. And so this is going to say 45 times 3 is going to be 135. And so it's an elaborate way of doing simple multiplication. You'll find yourself using these operands of plus equal and times equal uh, very frequently. Next, we have lesson number two. Um, the final challenge is there's a lot of them. I don't know why I threw in so many, but um, here they are. And this is just doing a, a simple addition and then combining it with the string of tomatoes. So it's saying int of 2.23, which is going to round down to 2, and then a float value of 14, which doesn't change the value at all. Add them together to give us 16 and then convert that into a string and add it to tomatoes. So that'll give us a 16 space tomatoes value for the variable a. Next we have some simple string operations. Uh, this dot upper, when you add that to the end of a string, it'll uppercase everything within that string. Or the opposite will happen when you do that to uh, dot lower and that'll lowercase everything within a string. Next we have a, another string operation called split and this is going to, by default, split the spaces up. So anywhere there is a space within I am ham, it's actually going to separate those elements out. And so that's why we're outputting a list of I, and then another element M, and then another element ham. And then we can actually feed in stuff into that split uh, as an argument um, in here, and we can feed in M, and it'll actually split up and remove all the M's. Out of it. So up above we removed all the spaces, down below we're actually removing all the M's and separating them out, uh, separating out the elements into a list by that. Next I want to show you a method of combining strings or uh, join is a commonly used method used to join strings together or to convert a list of strings into a single string. You could do this by typing uh, open and close quotation marks dot join and then pass in your list into the parentheses. But this is a way of feeding in one string into another and uh, it'll actually feed it between every single character. So you'll see um, B right here is I am ham and then A is actually 16 tomatoes. So what is going to happen is ev between every character for A, we're actually going to stick in B, which is I am ham. So it has one, I am ham, six, I am ham, and then there's going to be a space. I am ham, and so on and so forth. So it gets this really long, ugly string in here. I don't know why I threw in this example. It was just to show you that there are other things you can do with strings. Next, we have another string operation, which is the percent sign D, which will say, hey, substitute this in with an integer, um, and then, or a whole number. And so that's going to substitute 14 in here. And then we also have percent sign dot 5F. So what that's saying is that we're going to have five zeros after the decimal point, um, and it's going to be a floating point number. So this uh, 55.2 is actually going to be output to 55.2, 0000. 
Okay, then we have a list of a whole bunch of numbers. Now this is really interesting stuff, uh, what you can do to manipulate lists and get specific outputs from them. I find myself using these tricks all the time. So if you ever want to duplicate a list, you can actually just do brackets, uh, colon, bracket, and that'll output uh, an exact copy of the list. So if you're finding you want to make a copy of this to somewhere else without actually uh, manipulating this specific list, this is the perfect way to do that. Next we have uh, colon two. This is saying output everything until an index of two, which would be the third element in the list. So it's gonna output the very first and the very second. And so that's why we get one six. Then we're saying two colon, and that's gonna say starting with the third element of the list or the index of two, we're gonna output everything into, uh, to a new list. And so that's gonna start at the seven and then go outward until it's finished. Then we have double colon. Double colon is doing something very interesting. Double colon says you're going to be declaring a pattern. In this case, two means we're gonna be looking for even number indices. So this is gonna be an indice of zero, then two, then four, then six. And so we're gonna go see one, and then we're gonna jump two over, and we're gonna get seven, jump two over, then we're gonna get eight, jump two over, and then we're gonna get four. And so that's what we get right here, perfect. Now, uh, as an alternative, you could actually punch in a negative one and it'll actually reverse the entire list, which is very cool and very useful when you actually wanna grab the back end of it. And then for this last element, we're saying, hey, start with the uh, element index of one. So up above, we were grabbing the even indices. Now we're gonna be grabbing it by the odd indices by offsetting it by this one. And so we get six and then 26, three and then five, perfect. Okay, and here's part two of the examples. This was actually just to show a simple demonstration of a list within a list. Lists can hold anything, including themselves. So if you actually create one list, you can actually store it within another. So this next example was only for Python 2.7. This doesn't work in Python 3.3 or above because it's actually using a function called set, which Python 3.3 does not use or any newer versions use. Uh, I don't know why they removed this feature, but they did. Um, they also removed another uh, function called reduce, which we'll be getting to in a bit. Anyways, if you're using Python 2.7, this is a way of compressing a list in, that has redundant values. Like you see one in here multiple times, two in here multiple times, and three in here multiple times. You get uh, multiple of these values, but you're like, you know, I actually want to prune all those and just get only the unique values in there. And so this is, uh, Converting it to a set and then the list is one way to do that. But again, this is only 2.7 that'll do this. For this final example, this one was um, just creating a simple dictionary and then grabbing the keys from it, the values from it, and the length of it. Really simple stuff. Okay, moving on. Here we are at the end of lesson number three. And if you actually ran each of these, you'd find that elif was the one that ran because of the uh, logic going on inside of it. So up top you have if seven is less than six, uh, which it never is in any universe, at least <laughs> as far as I know, um, that'll never be true. So it says, and, and so we're just gonna go ahead and cancel this whole thing out. If this had said, or, then we would continue on and to test if the next statement was true. If neither of them are true, then we'd skip it. But it says since it says, and, it means both values must be true in order for the uh, uh, code below to be executed. So instead, we jump to the next statement, elif. It says, elif seven is less than six, which it is. Then we're gonna go ahead and print elif, which we do. And then on the right-hand side, we have if seven or three is greater than five. So since the seven is uh, actually a true statement in and of itself, the only false statement for a numeric value would be zero. Every other value is true, so seven is true. So if true, we're gonna go ahead and print yep, which we do, okay? And down below, we said if not six, so as I said just a second ago, um, any numeric value other than zero is gonna be true. So it says if not true, so if false, so it's gonna go ahead and jump down to the else and print nope, perfect. And for lesson four final examples, here we have a uh, clever way to create the Fibonacci sequence. 
And what this is doing is it's going to be assigning multiple values at once using this uh, a comma b is equal to zero comma one. And we use that down below so that we don't actually have to include a third variable to store the a values or b values when transferring their values. Okay. And it's just going to integrate through and it says while b is less than a thousand, then we're just going to keep going through and adding elements to the Fibonacci sequence. And it's basically a is going to swap with b. So B is going to be assigned to A now, and B is going to be assigned to uh, A plus B. And so it, that's how the Fibonacci sequence works. Uh, you start out with 0 and 1, and then you add those two together to get the next element. Add those two together to get the next element. And so you go 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and so on. Okay, and on the right hand side, this is an example, uh, this is a very cool example I found online to create a list of prime numbers. Since the beginning of computers, we always wanted to uh, find the slickest way um, that computers could use to determine the highest value of uh, prime numbers. The only problem is when you start with a uh, value of 1, then things get kind of funky. So that's why we just start with a value of 2 instead. Uh, but yeah, this is just going to integrate through and test to see if any previous uh, prime numbers are in the list. And if not, then we're just going to go ahead and add them to it and then print them. Okay. And this last example was one I kind of messed up on. I uh, meant to put, put in a time sign right here uh, instead of this plus sign to create the, to have this actually be a factorial function. Uh, factorial is basically, um, when you say four factorial or, or 10 factorial or something like that, it's basically like a 10 with an uh, exclamation point. That's a mathematical way of expressing one times two times three times four up until like uh, uh, whatever that value is. So it'd be times five times six if it was six factorial. And so you can get very big numbers very, very quickly. Um, running this up to 30 is actually like a pretty ginormous uh, number. So and then it ends up re resulting in uh, eight, eight, five, four, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm not gonna read that out loud. And then, uh, but instead I had actually messed up and this had been a plus sign. So if instead you found your answer was 435, that was correct. But yeah. Okay. So that's it for number four. Here's the final examples for number five. And here we're just using some of the exception handlers, uh, try, accept, and finally. And, uh, this is actually going to try to assign, uh, X, a value of a one over zero, which is a, uh, mathematical impossibility. Like it's, it's declared undefined. Uh, because you can never divide by zero and they'll actually result in a zero division error So it'll print out got it awesome So that would result in a zero division error and so it would actually call this um, Accept statement and it would go ahead and print print out uh, got it awesome on the right hand side We see another example and this one is going to go through a range of one to nine and it's going to check to see if the if the number is odd or even if it is odd, then it's going to go ahead and print out I. If it's even, it's going to go ahead and uh, result in a value of zero, which will make this statement false. Skip the pass and actually just uh, skip this value and move on to the next value in the for loop. So that will result in a list of one, three, five, seven, and nine. Awesome. And here we have the final examples for number six. So this top left example was just to show you that you can actually output multiple values from a single function by using commas in between the values. So you can return 20 comma 30. And so if you just call the function, you'll be able to see it'll output 20 comma 30. Very simple. Okay, right below that, we have another function to output factorial numbers. And this is a uh, slightly more compact way of outputting factorial numbers. And so what this will do is it's actually creating a function that's just saying x t times y. It's, that's all it's doing. It's just returning that. This example will only work in Python 2.7. It won't work in 3.3 .3 because, again, uh, reduce has been removed uh, from uh, 3.0 versions of Python. And uh, reduce is just saying, hey, uh, we're going to go through each element and run it through the function. And it's just going to be like uh, the result of any output is going to be fed in as x. So it's the first number is going to be 1 times 2, and then it's going to result in 2, and it's going to be fed into x. So then it's going to be 2 times 3, fed into x. That's going to be 6. 6 times whatever the next value is, <laughs> and so on and so forth. And it's just going to go uh, and figure out the factorial value of uh, the range. And so it's going to result in this 36 million value right here. Okay, on the top right, we're going to have the 
a function that's just going to return a uh, cube of a number. Okay? And then what I do is I run a ton of values through that cube function by using this function called map. Um, and in actuality, you should encase this map function inside of a list function, so that way you convert it to an actual list. And so the values can be output um, in v Python like 3.0 and above. Otherwise, it'll output a map object. And so this is just showing you that you can actually um, feed in a function into this first argument and then feed in a list of numbers that you want to run through that function and a very fast method called map. This is better than a for loop because it's just quicker. Next, we have our first example with uh, keywords. And this is just to say that like, hey, you can actually declare keywords in an argument, which basically says, hey, there's gonna be a default value. If there is no extra arguments passed in, I can take one or two arguments. And the second one will have a default value of 10. Otherwise, it'll be overridden with that second number. So when we pass in seven, it'll result in 17 because 10 is being added into it. Um, otherwise, we can add, pass an 8 and 5, and then it'll override that 10 value to become 5, and then add them together to result in 13. Cool stuff. Here we have the final examples from number 7. And our, in our file 1, we just have some simple uh, uh, functions created. In the second file, we're looking up the current objects in, available to this directory, to this uh, current file that's running. And we have built-ins, we have document file, we have uh, name, packages, etc. And then after we import it, we'll notice that our functions that we created up above will actually be imported here into this object list available to us. And since we typed from file one imports star, this is gonna import the functions as if they were already in this file. So we don't have to use any uh, f dot blah, 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 whatever to access those functions. Instead, we can just call them as they are. And so we call the function print ham, which is declared in the other file, and it works just fine. And on the right hand side, we're actually just importing it using a different method of uh, import blank as f. And we're saying using that f to access those functions instead. So on the left side, we imported it uh, with star, which allowed us to access the functions directly. And on the right, we imported it as a module, which we could access the functions with a uh, dot in between the function name. And then we'll jump over to the final examples for lesson number eight. So if you punched in the code, you'd end up with a value of 110 for this. And what's going on is we're creating an item called ham, and we're having a character uh, with a health of 100. And the hero has this function called eat, which is going to basically add the health bonus of the food passed in to his current health, and it'll have a new value for his health. And so then we create instances of each. We, we pass in ham to his eat function, and then boom, his, he has a new health of 110. Awesome. Then on the right hand side, we have a simple uh, class and function created to just add five to whatever we're passing in there. And then we have a, uh, another class to actually uh, store values of uh, whatever is being passed in in the constructor of the class, the instance when it's created. And then another variable to store what the new value is gonna be um, down the road. Here we create it uh, with a value of 15, then we create a, an instance of the class add five, and then we actually call the function add and add five to whatever the current value is and it'll create a 20. And then that's being fed into its variable other val. And so then we just output the values being stored and yeah, really simple stuff. All right, thank you so much for watching. Like, subscribe.